Hello everyone, Joe Gonzalez here, president of Nosotros. I'm beyond excited to introduce the third annual Yatu Sabes Monarch Slam presented by NBC. As you know, Nosotros has been working for over 50 years to enhance the image of Latinos both in front of and behind the cameras. A lot of progress has been made. However, there's room for improvement. We continue to be as a people marginalized, miscategorized, and even criminalized before we are recognized for the contributions we make to this industry and this country. Nosotros stands for we. We as a people coming together collectively will have a strong enough voice to make change. But change starts with us by putting our best works forward, front and center for the world to see. Programs like Yatu Sabes are an example of that. So to all our finalists, congratulations. To all of you that submitted and didn't get selected this year, it's not a setback, it's a setup for things to come. So once again, congratulations to our finalists. Thank you to NBC and our sponsors and enjoy the show. Hola, ¿qué tal amigos? Soy Mariana, Vice Chair of Nosotros. I want to thank you for tuning in and welcome you to the third annual Ya Tu Sabes Monologue Slam presented by our friends, NBC. The last two years have been difficult, but we've made it a point to work through all the hurdles and put the call out to our comunidad to showcase the best of the best. And as we start to see the light at the end of this pandemic, we want to remind you that Nosotros is here to be your voice, to represent you, even in the face of the pandemic. So thank you so much for all of your support, and I hope you enjoy the show. Porque ya tú sabes. My name is Javi Calderon, and the monologue I wrote is the Puerto Rican with the Mets hat. I am a native New Yorker, uh, born in Brooklyn, raised in Queens, but I'm back in Brooklyn now. I just started writing in 2018. Um, I saw a show called Atlanta, and it was the first time on television I seen people talk and speak like me. So I thought, wow, this is amazing. Um, I would want to do something like this. So my mom's a teacher, and um, I thought about uh, if I was a teacher, how I would be. And uh, I would, I'm Puerto Rican, so I would probably wear a Mets hat to go into the class. And, this is how I would conduct my classroom. And that's where the title came from. Originally home is New York, Long Island especially. It's where I was born and raised. Then I moved out here uh, for graduate school. I got my Master's of Fine Arts at the uh, California Institute of the Arts in acting. And I just graduated this May, this past May, 2021. I'm looking through all these monologues and I see the Puerto Rican with the Mets hat. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm a Puerto Rican. And I love the New York Mets. I'm a Mets fan, you know, <laughs> born and raised a Mets fan. And I mean, I'm just so honored to have completed it all, you know, for my family. I think I'm the, I'm the very first person in my family to actually like acquire a master's and things like that. And, but it's also very scary because now I have to face the real world. <laughs> Kids, my personal motto is fuck everyone because that's their motto towards me. Nobody talks to us, nobody cares about us, nobody listens to us. Well, not until it's an election year, and then you have politicians playing Despacito on their iPhones and speaking cringy Spanish into a microphone pretending they know our culture, right? Latinx, Latinx, Latinx. Who coined this term? I mean, I support the movement behind the term, I like to think of myself as progressive in many ways. I just don't know where it came from. You see, our history is a bit fabricated in this country, if you haven't realized. I mean, if you do your own research, I mean, I, I, no, yeah. if you do your own research, that's not how I want to sound. I'm a Puerto Rican from New York, like a lot of you, and I never heard this term Latinx until I was around a bunch of older white people who were trying to sound politically correct. Now, let me tell you something about these older white people kids. They're fucking smart and manipulative. So when I hear a term like Latinx, I question the shit out of it because I never heard it from someone like us. I, 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 I know, I know, like us, a broad term. You're Puerto Rican, she's Dominican. My homie back there, he was from Ecuador, but let me tell y'all something. We're all the same. 
Some of our ancestors were in this country before those conquistador motherfuckers came over, raped and slaughtered most of them, and then the slave trade happens, and then war and war and war. And war and war, there's a lot of war in our history, okay? Not by choice. Did you know the Taino Indians used wooden weapons to fight so they wouldn't severely injure their opposition? That's the warm-hearted part of us. Then there's the part of us that hates to be crossed. You don't cross a Latinx without facing some, ah, fuck that, man. Uh, can, 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 we, can we use Latine instead? I like that way better. All right, well, you don't cross a Latine without facing some sort of backlash, okay? But generally, we're a trusting people, you know? But when we get crossed, it's like our whole history comes roaring out of us. Why do we do it? After all the years of being crossed, why do we trust people? Look, I'm not trying to confuse you guys. I just want you to understand that we're a complicated people. We laugh, we dance, we suffer, we cry. But if there's one thing I want you to take away from this class, it's that we're the ones. We're the ones that have to lead. I mean, all of y'all are leaders. So when I say fuck everyone, I mean fuck everyone that tries to bring you down, fuck everyone that tries to say you're not good enough or that, or that this isn't your country because, Papi, this was your country before it was theirs. Huh? And Mommy, you inherited this country from your ancestors too. And Papi, Papi, well, Papi, one of your ancestors was probably a slave and the other was probably running the slave trade. We got a little piece of everybody in us. History literally runs through our blood. So let's use that history to move ourselves forward because if there's one thing that's a fact, it's that we're underrepresented in this country and we don't have enough of our voices out there trying to change the world. And who better to do it than the people that got a little piece of everybody in? Change the world. I know. Sounds ridiculous. But it's possible. And it starts by you not giving a fuck about what anybody says. It starts by you knowing who you are. And who you are is everything. I'm Reagan Lopez. I'm the actor and writer of the monologue Shame. So I'm originally from El Paso, Texas, which is on the border of Mexico, New Mexico, and Texas. And I have been living in New York City for about 10 years. My monologue is mostly about being mixed and not knowing Spanish, and I think that's a part of being mixed that a lot of people struggle with. Um, I'm not trying to tell anyone else's story but my own. I've just had so many instances in life where people are like, you should know Spanish. Like, shame on you. Like, even my mom and my dad sometimes would be like, yeah, it's a shame that we didn't teach you. And I think there's a lot of layers on top of, like, why it's not a shame. and. You know, my dad is the Mexican one of my parents and um, his family was very American. They were very, you know, they did kind of like what they had to to survive and that was assimilate in a way. And so I don't think there's any shame in like living in that way. And the fact that I don't know Spanish is just like who I am. Will I learn Spanish? Like I'd love to learn Spanish, but I'm not gonna learn Spanish through people shaming me. Oh, no, I don't speak Spanish. I, I, I know what you want to say. Shame, right? Shame. I mean, I, I could tell you the story that my Mexican grandma was teaching me Spanish until she died when I was two, and my Mexican grandpa was pretty sick until he died when I was nine, but that probably wouldn't be good enough for you anyway, and, and I'm honestly tired of telling it. Oh, now you feel a little bad for me. What a shame you say. Well, yeah, it is. But you don't stop there. I can hear it about to slip off your tongue. 
Well, shame on your parents then. <laughs> you sneaky shame shifter, shame on them. And now I get defensive because I have really great parents who are loving, kind, hardworking. The list could go on and on. They taught me to be proud of who I am, an American of Irish Mexican descent, but they didn't teach me Spanish, so I guess that voids everything else they did, right? You know, no one asked me if I speak Irish Gaelic, by the way. Oops, I made you think. But you are dying to wipe that shame across my face, make me stew in it like a child in time out. Well, shame on you. <laughs> well, third time's the charm, I'm sure. I, I'm an adult. I mean, I, I could have, excuse me, should have learned it by now. I mean, I grew up on the border. I really have no excuse. If not from my Mexican grandparents or my Mexican dad or my white mom, who's actually fluent in Spanish, I could have learned it in high school or college or from my Mexican husband and his family. <laughs> Did I surprise you with that last one? But would speaking Spanish make me any less of a weta? Because if I did speak Spanish, I'd still be a weta, and you'd still judge me before I opened my mouth, right? I mean, I could dye my hair and tan my skin, but then that would be something else. So there's really only one thing I can do. I reject your shame. I am so sorry. I just, I can't take it. Because English and Spanish are both colonizer languages, because Latinos are not a monolith. We are black and brown and Asian and sometimes wetas like me. The vastness of our experiences cannot be boiled down into one language or one look. And shame is not a great motivator. If it were, I'd be the most fluent Spanish speaker on the planet by now. It's, it's actually had the opposite effect on me, so sorry. You can keep your shame. It doesn't match my hair. Yo, what's up, fam? It's John Huertas, back again, and I wanted to give each and every one of you a huge shout out and congratulations to all of our writer and actor finalists of this year's Yatu Sabes Monolog Slam. Tonight is the night, the culmination of all of your hard work. Just know that we see you and we support you and we wish you all of the success for your creative career ahead. Break a leg finalists, let's go. Well, I'm originally from Quintana Roo, Mexico. I currently live in Ciudad de Mexico in Mexico City. It's funny because it was based on an experience that actually happened to me, but I was driving back into the US. We had the conversation, it started off as the one that you see in the monologue. It was literally like me just explaining this situation. It was actually me journaling. I was literally journaling about like the situation. And as we, I started talking to this girl that I didn't know very well, we realized that she was like, you know, it's actually really normal. Like everybody, all my family members, every time they go back in, they feel really nervous. And she's like, you don't have to feel nervous. Like you're an American citizen. It's funny because I auditioned last year as an actor um, and then I was reading the monologues and I, the one that really touched me was actually the winner, not all tamales look the same. Cause I was like, yeah, like, you know, you really connect to one of them. And I was like, this was really, it was really fun to read. I felt seen in the monologue. And so this year I went through kind of a bit of a depression and I just was writing. I am originally from a small little border town called Mission, Texas, but now I'm based out in New York city. Yeah, so it started off, I knew from when I was about like two years old that I wanted to act, I saw Barney and I was like really wanting to do what they did because I wanted to be on Barney and my parents told me about acting and they were like, those are called actors, that's what they do. And I just sat there and I was like, that's what I'm gonna be when I grow up until I got to Tufts University and I had my first Latino theater and film class um, with my professor, Noe Montes. I came from the border, lived like 30 minutes away from Mexico and I didn't know that was a thing um, that our people wrote theater, you know, it was just how we'd been displayed in like the gangsters kind of idea that I'd seen. So I kept telling myself I had to be a certain type of actor. Um, and then when I took his class and he was introducing me to like Zoot Suit and, and all of these incredible writers like um, Sandra Cisneros and Tania Saracho, it became a thing that was like, oh, I can, I can be me. So remember, when they ask us where we went, you say, Uh-huh, yeah, that's right. Just a week at the beach in Ensenada. Yeah, I know, I know, that's where we actually went. I was just double-checking. 
Okay? I don't want any problems or questions when we get to the border, all right? Hey. Uh-uh. Don't give me that look. All right, look. If you had to wake up every morning at 4 a.m. to cross the border to go to school, and there are a ton of rules you had to remember when crossing, you'd also be a little near... Oh my god, is that... Is that a banana? Holy shit! Don't you put in a banana? You can't bring in fruits or vegetables, you dummy! Yeah, 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 okay. Okay, 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 um... Here. Eat it. Yeah, no, I'm serious, you have to eat. So when they ask us, we can say, nothing to declare. Oh. Man, I don't know why <laughs> crossing this border always brings up all this anxiety. <laughs> Probably, because all my life it's always... Where are you going? What did you do? Where are you from? No, <laughs> where are you really from? Like if my mere existence is something to be questioned, like <laughs> I was born in this damn country, I'm an American citizen, okay? Like what else do you want from me? Isn't that enough? <laughs> you know what? Now fuck that. I do, I do have something to declare because not only was I born in this country, I am worthy of being here and not because my ancestors gave you tacos or popcorn or gum, which we did, by the way. Oh, yeah, the Mayans were the first to discover chicle. Mm -hmm. But we also invented the color television and we gave you tequila and chocolate and, um, and Selena. Okay, well, I guess technically Selena's from Texas. But we gave you Texas, yeah, and, and Arizona, and California, and Utah, and Nevada, and New Mexico. So really, at the end of the day, the point is that we gave you Selena. Yeah. So next time they ask me if I have something to declare, I'm a motherfucking say. Nope. Nope. Nothing to declare. <laughs> Just, you know, because I want to skip secondary inspection. But you better believe I'm going to be thinking it. I am originally from the Yucatan in Mexico, so that's like southeast, and I'm living now in New York, in Brooklyn. I actually got an email for a grant to go to do a one-year conservatory, and my I had an aunt in Long Island, and it kind of like, the stars aligned, my family was very supportive of me wanting to pursue a career in theater and in writing, and it, it kind of just happened. This is kind of a weird thing, but it is It is from, I am from Yucatan. We sleep in hammocks, and people are usually able to uh, switch between beds and hammocks, and now that everyone has AC, they are able to sleep in a bed, but I can't. I sleep in a hammock. My hammock is hanging in Brooklyn. So it's been a very interesting uh, challenge to live and love and date and just like stay over with friends and try to sleep in a bed. It, it's, it's, I can't. It was the first monologue that made me fully belly laugh. And I think it was just because of how human and genuine it was while still having all this depth. And it, it was just this human experience of how you want to be seen and heard, and then being completely terrified of the vulnerability it takes to be seen and heard. I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, California. I am first generation Salvadoreña Americana. And, you know, I, I was lucky enough to be so steeped in my culture growing up that it really formed that foundation of pride. You know, I really think that I explored the part of myself that is constantly battling between I want to be, I want someone to accept me. And then also the part of me that's like just scared witless of like, this is me, I'm a mess, love me. And you know, you, you, there's always this battle of see me, but like, don't judge me. I put salsa de habanero on his pasta matrichan. He was so upset. You don't put hot sauce on pasta matrichan, are you crazy? You just ruined a perfect dish. And I'm sorry, but I tried it before and it was anything but perfect. It was lacking a kick and I gave it to it. And then I really enjoyed it. It was yummy. 
after the habanero, that is. Listen, I've learned to carry around my chili powders and my salsa picante. Otherwise, you end up at some pseudo-Mexican place and all they have is Tabasco. Everywhere you go, Tabasco. I hate Tabasco. He asked me where I got the sauce from. I said, my purse, of course. I carry my chilito, my salsita, my toothbrush, and extra underwear, just in case. I was trying to be flirtatious, and then he says, Ugh, so you sleep around? I don't sleep around. I don't. I can't. Not because I'm a prude or anything. I can't sleep. I have insomnia. Okay, it's not really insomnia. It's just that I need all these things to sleep, like my mouth guard. I cannot sleep without it. I get a massive headache because I clench my jaw. But I don't think it's very sexy, so I try not to wear it around a guy I'm sleeping with or having sex with. Anyway, we've established that I can't sleep. I also need my eyes covered. And what about my fan? I need white noise in order to sleep. Fine, all of those things have a solution. I could even play my white noise on my phone. Did you know that YouTube has these 10 hour videos of just fan noises? Anyway, none of that actually matters. The real issue here is that I sleep in a hammock. I know what you're probably thinking. What a hipster. But no, the hammock, it's a cultural thing. I'm from a very hot and humid part of Mexico. The Yucatan Peninsula, you know? The Mayans? Chichen Itza? Cancun? Cancun usually rings a... Anyway, before AC, it was impossible to sleep in a bed. So people had hammocks. My mother put me in a hammock as a child and left me there. So 30 years later, I still can't sleep in a bed. I know you have a million questions like, wait, you sleep in a hammock? Do you have a hammock in your room? Wait, so you don't have a bed. Isn't that bad for your back? Wait, can two people sleep in a hammock? Wait, 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 how do you have sex in a hammock? No, no, it's just me in my hammock because as it turns out, the walls in America are all made of gingerbread so they can't hold the weight of two people going at it. But for now, all you need to know is, yes, I sleep in a hammock all year round. I don't want to leave right after sex. I like to cuddle. You have to understand that I don't want to give a Yucatan history lesson to every one night stand. So I omit the fact that I sleep in a hammock and I try my best to sleep in a bed with another human being. Hola familia, como están? Natasha Galano here, Media and Communications Director for Nosotros Org. I want to give a big, huge congratulations to this year's Yatu Sabes actor and writer finalists. As someone who is in charge of our social media presence, I see your faces, I, I hear your voices, I see what you consider your struggles, which are actually your triumphs, which makes today Yatu Sabes so much more special. I am so happy and excited and proud to be helping you showcase your talent um, and bridging that gap between Latinx creative. Just want to give a big shout out to all of you guys out there. Just know that we're creating a safe space, a community for you. Am I going to get emotional? Um <laughs> Um, and as a reminder to all of you out there, make sure to follow us at Nosotros Org on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook for all of our information about our events, our masterclasses, everything coming up in 2022. Break a leg, actors and writers. I'm from Central Florida, Orlando, uh, but my family is from Puerto Rico. The Audad City is inspired loosely by my own life. I wasn't raised my father. This is a, a thought that came into my life. I was like, oh, this is pretty, pretty damn scary. So let me, let me write this up. Let me uh, see, you know, what comes out of it. Just by exploring that. I think that's what I do as a comedian. We take our pain and we make it humorous. So I make this dark topic, you know, 
And it, this is basically a glimpse into that person's life. This is the zoom in, this is that moment. What decision do we make? This is very crucial. Do you just leave the hospital and say, man, forget that guy? Or do you face your fear and try to work it out? I was born in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, and I grew up in the Bronx, New York, and now I'm in LA. You know, this monologue, at first glance, you read it and you think it's, it's really funny. And then the more you read it, you realize it's actually not funny, it's really sad. That's what drew me to it because it's this whole struggle of acting like everything's fine. And that's what I do 24 seven. I make jokes and I uh, laugh all the time to seem like everything's fine when it probably isn't. But I think that's such normal human behavior because we're socially conditioned to act a certain way in public. And I think that monologue explores this so well, especially because I mean, this what this character wants to do is just scream and be upset and, and be mad and cry. And but you can't do that because you're in public and you know, you're a decent civilized person. You all got some nerve. Ma'am, please, no offense. I know you're a nurse here, but I don't want to talk <laughs> to you or that guy who claims today <laughs> that he's my father. <laughs> you know, you know when the hospital called and said, Mr. Lopez Garcia Rodriguez wanted to talk? I knew something was up. I, I, I was doing just fine. Just fine. Ignoring my childhood problems, pretending that he never existed, and now this. Freaking audacity. I don't hear from him since I was three. And now I have to decide his fate once he becomes a complete vegetable. <laughs> oh. 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 God has a sense of humor, man. <laughs> You know, when I was 11, my mother was working two jobs while I was alone at home. I prayed that I could have had someone to play with, wishing that my father would just show up one time for a birthday, graduation, or shit, just show up. <sighs> Is this universe sick or what? <laughs> I have to decide. Want to pull the plug? <laughs> he, he, he must literally have no one else, huh? Just basically lived his life for others. To simply die alone. You, um, you, you said he's gonna be brain dead? Oh. Well, let, let, let me use whatever time I have left. I'll regret it if I don't. I'm sorry for yelling at you. After this, I'm definitely gonna need a therapist. <laughs> My name is Margarita Olmos and I wrote the monologue, Empty Box of Cereal. I am from East Los Angeles. I just uh, got back around a year ago. I went to UC Davis, hit that, and then just got back. I had this whole dream, you know, UC Davis, animal science. I uh, was gonna go do that and then realized math is hard, chemistry, hard. And then theater just pulled me right back in. It's what I know, it's what I love. It's what I've always done. Um, so got a degree in theater and sociology. Like a lot of my writing, I think it's a lot of me trying to heal a lot of 
former things and using that as a, an outlet for myself. A couple months back before that, I had just gotten diagnosed with ADHD. So it was a lot of like, oh, hey, I have this new shiny little title that's going to fix everything. I'm going to get my life together and then didn't. So it's like very much just about being stuck in this like moment of trying to get better. But somehow everybody around you is seeing that big potential that you just can't see. I was born and raised in Matamoros, Tamaulipas, Mexico, which is the border town to Brownsville, Texas. So um, born and raised Matamoros, schooled in Brownsville, Texas, went to school at Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas, and now I'm in New York City. The moment I found out that I could do it again, I was like, all right, let's do it. But I'm always wanting people to see the different things that I can do. Everybody has this idea that you can only do one thing or, you know, we've only seen you do this thing. So last year was obviously a comedy, I think. People laughed. Um, and so this year I'm like, you know what, I'm going to do something that's a little bit more dramatic, but still bring myself to it. So when I read the piece, it just felt like every monologue has its roller coaster, right? But this one felt like we were literally from the beginning going all the way up and then just seeing the dive into where this person ends up. Hey, I just got out. Um, this is my third time calling you. I hope you're on your way now. Oh, they gave me a wheelchair to get to the car. I don't get to keep it though, unfortunately. I think they caught on to the fact that I probably wouldn't return it. So the nurse insisted on waiting with me until you got here. She got a little impatient though. I tried to make small, small talk with her, but um, both know I'm not very good at that. She's this little old lady. Reminded me of your mom, actually. A little corajuda, but well-intentioned. She scolded me the entire way here because I refused to let the hospital call me an Uber. But I was like, no, no, my boyfriend, sorry, ex-boyfriend will be here soon. Which I really hope is true because I'm a little scared as to what she will do when she gets back and you're not here. But I guess I also will not know what I'll do if and when you show up. Because that's what I'll do, huh? Yeah. Uh, maybe ask, uh, how? Why? I mean, one minute we're planning a trip to New York and the next I am sobbing in the shower. Is this really how it ends? You leaving me stranded with a broken leg, which is your fault, by the way, both the crying and the spilled dandruff shampoo I so comedically slipped on. You're right. I am just this disaster waiting to happen, this over-emotional, out-of-touch, selfish void. An empty box of cereal? <laughs> God only knows how you managed to make such poetic attacks on me. God, I want to be so angry with you, but I can't because it's not like you're wrong. I mean, I am sad and I wouldn't want to be around me either. I mean, you just had to find out the hard way. I am not this quirky, negative Nancy. I wish I was. I wish I, I, I didn't hate my life, my job, my dad, or even the larger systems acting on me. I wish I could be content with the life that we created for ourselves. And if I could just shut off my brain, I would be the smartest person everybody already pretends that I am, but I can't. So it is currently exhausting. It's exhausting to just put on a smile every day. So I am sorry. You had to see the imposter that I am. But hey, we're over. Yay. I mean, hopefully now you'll just see what everybody else sees. You know, this like gifted first generation Latina who's just trying to change the world. Unless you block me, then you'll just have to remember me as the unorganized, insecure crybaby you fell out of love with. But hey, maybe one day my meds will work.
I was really hoping that they would do more than just let me do dishes, you know? Something along the lines of like, I don't know, not measuring my self-worth with productivity or capital or success. But alas, um, I, I can't predict the future or promise that I'll become the super rare toy you find in a cereal box. I really don't blame you. And I guess I just answered my question in that matter. So I'm going to go find the answers to my first question, find a nurse, and get myself home. Text me when you want to pick up your things. Hola familia, I'm Melissa Barrera and I just wanted to pass by and, and give a huge shout out and congratulations to the actor and writer finalists of this year's Ya Tu Sabes Monologue Slam. Incredible work and tonight is the night. Don't be nervous, enjoy, you've made it here. That means you're talented, you're good and just enjoy this moment. I mean, what else can I say? We believe in you. We are rooting for you. Um, and I cannot wait to see your incredibly prosperous careers ahead of you. Um, break legs. Hi, my name is Diego Lanao, and I wrote the monologue Reaching the Moment. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. I just moved to LA two months ago, so just in time for this event. I come from a medical family. My dad was a doc. My dad is a doctor. My mom was a nurse. The path to be a doctor was, you know, like in the horizon, but I decided, you know, I just always loved the creative aspect of it all. I just loved, you know, interacting with people and hearing their stories rather than actually diagnosing medical problems. A lot of times, a lot of people get scared of an outcome rather than actually enjoying like an adventure or a journey, they get kind of worried, especially when it comes to like romantic relationships. So I think I just got inspired by a lot of people, especially in New York, you hear a lot of love stories. So I just kind of wanted to write something where somebody would actually take the initiative to start a love story, even if they don't know how it'll end. Hey, how's it going? My name is Jared Trevino, and I'll be reading Reaching the Moment. Uh, so I'm from Corpus Christi, Texas, repping the 361. And uh, <laughs> and now I'm out here in LA. I've, I've had some, some amazing teachers who believed in me whenever I really didn't believe in myself. I wasn't really good at school. I wasn't really good at sports, <laughs> always sitting the bench, <laughs> you know? And uh, yeah, the first time I ever felt like I was good at something was because a teacher told me that I was good at acting. I don't know, ever since then, I was like, you know what? I might not be good at anything else in life, but if there's one thing I am good at, um, it's acting. And it's, it's, it's because of a teacher, her name was Miss B. Yeah, well, I, I like this monologue for, for a number of reasons. I think one, it's, I mean, it's a love story. You know, it's in, and, and it's about this guy who's taking a risk on love and he's asking for someone to take this risk with him. And then what I explored within myself was, man, just, just how, how far I've come in taking risks for myself. Look, I know you're not gonna be here for long and I'm someone who's just recently popped up in your life, but I'd like to get to know you as much as possible. And, and I'd, I'd love to make whatever days we got left together count. And uh, I really want to, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Do you know what happens when you go skydiving? I mean, I wouldn't know. I've only heard stories from friends. But what they tell me is that as soon as you're about to jump, the instructors say on three, one, and then they just jump. No warnings, no second guessing. They, they just jump because the moment the door opens, your legs dangle midair and and you get scared, which only makes the jump more difficult if, if you freeze up. And it's, it's human nature to get scared at the last second, sensing how unrealistic it is to be viewing the world from that high above. And uh, I've always been someone who's tried to plan out every step so that way I'd be 
prepared for any obstacle, but I stop and I think, and I process for so long that I, I, I don't end up doing shit. I don't want to freeze up anymore. I just, I want to jump and enjoy the fucking view as I'm falling and I'll worry about the landing when it happens, not before, not after. And, and, and look, look, I know you're probably thinking, you're not looking for anything too serious. You don't want to get too attached, but we made it this far, you know? We passed the point of only talking about the weather. We stopped talking about our work lives the, the second day we met and, and now we're, we're, we're talking just, just to talk. And it takes a lot of fucking work to get there with someone that you never met before. And I just, I, I, I want to live it with you. And I, and I want to keep the momentum going, even, even if I don't know where it's going to lead to. Because what's the point of reaching that moment if you're not going to enjoy it? I am a uh, Latina, born and raised in the Bronx, New York. I come from a background of trauma. They say, write what you know. So I write what I know. And I wanted to show that there is a way out for women who are struggling in bad relationships, have come from an abusive background, that there's a way through and a way out. And those, that is everything I write. That monologue is real. It's not made up, it's real. And when I saw the competition on, and I started thinking about what do I want to write, I said, you know, I want to show, I just want to, I just want to write what's real and what's true and that forgiveness is not about the other person. Like we need to learn how to forgive so that we can grow and that we can move on. And that's the message I wanted to send in that piece. Hi, my name is Bernardo Castilla, and I'll be performing I Forgive You. Well, I'm from Merida, which is in the south of Mexico, uh, in Yucatan. I watched the performance in London, a Hamlet uh, production, and the main actor was Andrew Scott. Just what he did with, with that text, you know, it's Shakespeare, and sometimes it can be so heightened and you lose sense of reality, but he just made it completely completely his own and it was so grounded everything he said you you immediately connected to it so that to me was like okay that's that's acting I read this beautiful beautiful piece which was written by Deborah and I just felt immediately drawn to it I felt like I I needed to to do it it's very it's it's not very often as an actor that you come across a piece that that just aches to be, to be said and to be heard. I'm not sure if you can hear me or not. Some people think they can be heard when speaking to someone in a coma. I'm not sure if that's true, but I have something to say. And I hope you can hear this. I thought long and hard about this and... I need you to know that I forgive you. I need you to know, not for you, but for me. I forgive you. I forgive you for taking my innocence away from me. I forgive you for taking my childhood away and I forgive you for suffocating my soul. Most of my life, I, I could not make sense of all that I was feeling or what I should say, what I was unable to feel. I tried so hard to cover the pain, but nothing worked. 
the alcohol, the drugs, the destructive and dangerous choices I made. Nothing numbed the horror of my pain. You almost destroyed me. You are the monsters in my nightmares and the ugliness that consumed me. You had no right to do what you did to me. I lived my life in fear and darkness was all I knew. After my suicide attempt, I knew I had to do something. I knew I had a right to be happy after all. I didn't do anything wrong, so I reached out for help and I fought for myself and it has been the hardest thing I've ever had to do and I need you to know that I survived. I survived the sexual abuse and the mental abuse. I survived. I need you to know that. The doctors say you probably won't come out of this coma and it will be any day now before you pass on. I often wonder if, if there is a hell and if that is where you'll end up. I hope you go to heaven. I I really do, because I can't imagine what you must have been through as a child to become the person you are. I do truly pray that you rest in peace. I have to go now, Daddy, and I don't know if you need to know, but I will be okay. You don't get to hold me hostage anymore. Your death will finally set me free. Goodbye, Daddy. Hola a todos, my name is Samantha Garcia and I'm the head of the newsletter department for Nosotros. First off, we want to congratulate all of the finalists for all of their hard work and talent. The talent and the stories that we've seen today have been remarkable and out of this world. For all of you watching at home, I want to encourage you to visit Nosotros.org where you can find unlimited resources within our community and where you can also subscribe to our newsletter where we send out weekly topics and spotlight our members. So we'll be sure to be spotlighting you soon. My name is Maoro Zana and I wrote Mejorando la Raza. I was born and raised in Miami, Florida. You know, welcome, bienvenidos a Miami. <laughs> um, and now I'm based in Los Angeles, California, but Miami holds my heart. I was angry at the parts that as an actress were being given to me. And I was angry that I had to fight for three lines for the honor of being a gangbanger's girlfriend on screen. I was angry that eventually they were like, oh, okay, okay, you're right. You're not all gangbangers. You're also maids. And I was like, Oh, I see. I'm done waiting for your extended hand. I'm done waiting for your grace to give me a small part that doesn't even represent our culture. I'll make my own things. A conversation that I had the first time I came to LA. My mother had old family friends from Honduras that we went to visit and they looked at me and my brother. My father is, is a, I guess he's white. He's of Middle Eastern descent, but they're classified as white. And so we're lighter than her. My mom is brown. I am not. And the way that they said, oh, wow, like, well done, bien hecho, like they turned out good, uh, made me so angry that I, and, and I didn't say anything rude, but I was like, 
like because they said uh no se parecen indígenas ni un poco that's real in the monologue these are real things people have said to me in my life and i remember answering back but yo soy indígena and they looked at me like i was crazy like why would you say that my family is they're all angelinos and i am third generation angelino um i am very proud of that my father and my uncle grew up in Boyle Heights, and I was raised in the foothills of Los Angeles. It's been a tough year. Um, when I read this monologue, I just, I lost my brother this year to COVID. And I lost my uncle recently as well. Ooh. I also lost a mentor and it's just been a lot, you know. Um, and when I read this piece, I knew that these hard discussions with loved ones, you don't have much time to have them. And that they're necessary you know, to hold space for each other. To make sure that everyone can be their full selves and that you don't have to hide your indigenous roots or be ashamed of them. But it is a big deal to me, Mom. Do you remember when I was a kid and got lost at the mall, security wouldn't give me back to you because they didn't believe you were my mother. Are you sure you're not the nanny? They said, and I remember them too. You just laughed. Ay, mi hora de la raza vie. I'll never forget the way Doña Malita praised you for it, not realizing it erases you from my history. Er erases as well as blood from my veins because you can no longer see it on my face. Ay, qué lindo salieron sus hijos. No se parecen indígenas ni un poco, she said. And I wanted to scream out, but I am. And what's so wrong about looking indígena? It's not my place. I know. And my father's name is Coloring. But still, can't they see how much of you there is in me? Can't they see that it's your fire burning in my eyes? You're the one who taught me to look at people and then directly. Sin miedo y con orgullo. I am proud of my heritage. I am so proud to have you as my mother. <laughs> so tell me, Mom, how can you laugh in those moments and say it's not a big deal? How can you let them talk to you like you've done some great service to La Raza by erasing where you came from? My name is Sophie Goldstein, and the monologue that I wrote is called Nena. I've been involved in theater for most of my life, but the past eight years I've been mainly focused on directing and choreographing, and knock on wood, it's actually gone pretty well. Writing, I've written sporadically, but never really thought of myself as a writer. During the pandemic is when I got really focused on it, and I'm grateful because it got me here. I don't know if otherwise I would have really focused on writing as much as I have at this moment. One, I'm a big fan of Marvel. Um, so that definitely came into play, but also thinking about how even it, we have yet to see a Latinx superhero. Um, so that definitely sparked it. But then also for me personally, like, okay, but then what, what would that look like for me? I'm originally from Boston, Massachusetts, first generation Puerto Rican, yeah. And I've been living in Los Angeles for about four years. I went to an arts high school across the street from Fenway Park called Boston Arts Academy. And then I went on to work for theater companies like Company One, Huntington Theater. I was 27 at the time. 
and I was like, what am I gonna do? I had all these friends and like we all do, we kind of like do the comparing thing, unfortunately, but I was seeing everyone move on and move up and go chase their thing. And I was like, what am I chasing? I had lost my way a little bit and talking to my father, he was like, you know what? I came to this country when I was 27. And I had my sister here and that was it. And at the time I was 27. So I said, fuck it. Can I swear? Sorry. <laughs> I said, you know what? Like, olvidalo. Like, there's, there's no time like the present. I'm not getting any younger. No tengo compromiso, you know? No tengo pareja, niño. I don't have anything that's holding me back. The only thing that's holding me back is myself. I love Marvel. No, but like, I love Marvel. And actually, maybe not Marvel the company because they just got bought out by Disney and corporations are evil, but I love superheroes. I do. I love the whole like, okay, so one day maybe you're, I don't know, weird. You're getting bullied. I don't know. It's just a normal day. And then boom, you get bit by a spider or you ingest some crazy chemicals. I don't know. Or you get shot up with some super serum. Or maybe you just had a mutation that you've had since birth. And then all of a sudden you have this like responsibility to humanity to save the world and only you can with your very special brand of superpowers. I love that. And okay, look, so there's Spider-Man, right? And there's Captain America. And well, Captain America can't do things that Spider-Man can and sometimes they're together and sometimes they're separate and it's cool, no beef. And I love those guys and okay, they're not all guys though, all right? So we got Rogue, we got Storm, we got Scarlet Witch, we got Captain Marvel, all badasses. We got Black Widow. Yo, Black Widow doesn't even have superpowers, but she's badass and I I love that. I, I do. No, 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 I, I do. I guess I just wonder why can't there be a superhero that looks kind of like me, you know? And I know it's kind of selfish, right? Like, the world doesn't revolve around me. I know, duh, right? But can't there be a superhero that's like a little chubby, maybe a little brown, you know, hails from the streets of El Sereno, you know? And like, is that like too much to ask? And, and, and okay, maybe the superhero isn't me. Like, what if it's my mom? You know, she was the first one in her family to graduate. And like, not only that, she went on to get her PhD, okay? My mom was a Chicana with a PH motherfucking D, right? And that's a superhero. So, okay, maybe there's this girl, this chingona ass girl who fights for what she believes in against all odds, all prejudices, all bullshit. And it's not just about her, right? Like it's about her in the community because when she gets these powers, it's about making sure that all of us come up and that all of us feel safe. That's what my mom did. You know, she, she went on to get her PhD and then became a psychologist and she dedicated her entire life to the comunidad, making sure that all of us got the respect that we deserve. She's gone now. And sometimes I want to scream because she should be here. And she would be here. If it wasn't for that frat white boy drinking and driving, she would. It does I get that white boy got off scot free. And of course he did. Okay, so, okay, maybe our superhero is someone who makes sure that people suffer the consequences of their actions. You know, like, maybe she's a little chubby and short and brown, like me and my mom. And maybe, maybe she has a necklace, right? Like, a, like this one, this is my mom's. And it's a simple gold chain and um, it has like a turquoise stone in it. And I don't know, it's been in her family for God knows who or how many years, but 
She gets this necklace and she hits it and then she has all of these superpowers that have been passed down from generation to generation. She has the speed, she has the skill, she has the knowledge because she's a direct descendant of Mayan people, warriors, kings, queens, and not only that, maybe she just has centuries of knowledge just flowing through her. Maybe she could have just helped the human way. Like maybe if she had just been the lawyer in that courtroom, maybe he would have gone to jail. <sighs> maybe I should brainstorm this. <laughs> um write the pilot and send it into Marvel, right? I know that that would be a lot healthier than sitting outside of this white boy's house plotting his demise. I know it'll be a lot healthier. I just can't seem to drive away. Hey everybody, my name is Roslyn Real and I am the director of outreach at Nosotros. First of all, huge, huge, huge congratulations to the finalists this year. Great work. I'm so excited for you. As a finalist last year, I can totally understand your excitement and maybe the jitters a little bit, but mostly the excitement. So congratulations. For everybody who's tuning in from home, we want to connect with you. We are so excited to do so. And we want to tell you about so many things that are going on at Nosotros beyond Ya Tu Sabes. We have master classes and we have workshops happening, mixers. And let me tell you, these bring in industry professionals to help guide you along on your path. So come in, we are so excited to have you. Thanks so much. And to the finalists, again, huge congrats. Yay. Break legs. Uh, so I like to say I'm from both Los Angeles, California and Paris, Tennessee. I moved to Paris, Tennessee when I was 11, but I was born and raised in Los Angeles, then came back for college and have been back pretty much ever since. I think it was actually when I started to work in film and television and I saw there weren't a lot of the stories that I grew up around or, or stories that I could relate to. And so I think for me that ignited a, a passion in me to want to write my own stories. It stems from a personal experience that I had when I was telling uh, my family that I wanted to move out. And that was the basis of the monologue. And I was so nervous to tell my family that I, I wanted to move out. And I don't even know why, because it ended up fine, you know? And our relationship is so much better now, and I'm so close with my family. And it was just something that I needed to do for myself. I'm from Miami, Florida. I grew up in Miami and my parents are from Nicaragua. They actually grew up on the same island, like 10 houses away from each other. So all of my family is from Nicaragua. Well, I've always had a really vivid imagination as a child. I just always known that I wanted to be a storyteller and I come from a family of storytellers who talk with their hands and make sound effects and noises when they tell stories. And I've just always been really theatrical, I guess. And I just knew that I wasn't meant to stay in Miami. I think as Latinos, we are just so connected to our parents, to our family. I remember when it was time for me to leave home, my mom was begging me to stay. And I know that is such a hard thing to finally grow up and, and just leave your parents. And you feel guilty because they work so hard and sacrifice so much to provide you with this home and then you're leaving it. So I actually was thinking of my mother the whole time. I got an apartment, I got an apartment, I got an apartment. Hey, uh, uh, Bobby, um, can I talk to you for a sec? Okay, so, um, 
I have some good news. I got an apartment. Wait, before you say anything, please hear me out. Okay, so this place is only a few miles away. It's not like I'm moving across the country or anything. I'll still come visit you and Abuelita every weekend. We'll still eat pozole on Sundays together and play Rumi Cube. I'll still help you pay your cell phone bill online every month. Just FYI, there's an automatic payment option I can help you set up so you don't have to pay online every month. But if you want me to keep coming by to help you pay it, I'm totally cool with that too. Look, I, I need you to know that me moving out doesn't mean I love you any less, okay? I, I actually think it'll make our relationship stronger. I'm approaching my 30s and I just need to try doing life on my own. And I know most of my other cousins continued living at home until they were married, but let's be real. You know I'm not expecting or wanting to get married anytime soon. Papi, I need to move out to feel some level of independence. I, I need to at least try. You know, when I moved in with you after college, it was the first time I had lived with you since I was eight years old. I didn't know how it was going to work out. I, I really thought I was only going to be here a few months until I figured out my life post-college. But months turned into years, and here we are. But these last few years with you have been monumental for me. We were able to make up for all the time we didn't get to have together growing up. Those years where you left to provide a better life for our family. I never told you this, but growing up, I was so angry at you for leaving. It felt like you were abandoning our family, abandoning me. But I realize now that you leaving to provide a better life for us was a selfless act. An act of love. And I don't want you to think that me moving out is me abandoning you. It's just a new chapter of my life. Now, B, I'm so thankful for all the sacrifices you've made for me. I'm the woman I am today because of you. No es adios. I will always be your mijita. No matter where I live. Hi everyone, I wanted to send out a huge thank you. An enormous thank you. Huge thank you. A huge thank you to our celebrity ambassadors. To our celebrity ambassadors. To all of our celebrity ambassadors. Thank you so much for your continued support of nosotros. Of nosotros. Of nosotros and of the community of Latinx storytellers. Your passion and enthusiasm. For showcasing and encouraging our voices. Our voices. Our voices. Keeps the fire of our culture burning bright. Keeps the fire of our culture burning bright. Thank you very much for all of the hard work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much again. We love you. I am originally from Inglewood, California. Not too far from here. I studied film at San Francisco State. I went up there for four years and I got a degree in film, but emphasis in directing. When I first wrote it, it was first rooted from my parents. You know, I would always see them work, work, work. My dad would work two to three jobs a week, you know. And as I continued writing, I realized that I'm not just talking about my parents. I'm talking about an entire community that goes through the struggle of working every single day and not knowing when to stop, but in the end, it concludes to where we're going to have to always keep working in order to see our people succeed. I'm originally from uh, Mexico. I was born there and partly raised there and then immigrated here 
not to Los Angeles, but immigrated to uh, Stockton, California when I was nine years old. My God, why I cried the first time I read it, just right off the bat. So it was an emotional reaction. Um, I it, it summed up the immigrant experience for me. Um, it summed up the struggles. Um, I'll get emotional talking about it. It sums up how unseen and unheard you feel as an immigrant in this country. And I don't think enough people know what that feels like or thankfully haven't experienced that. And the frustration of not feeling seen or heard is sometimes feel like the, the weight of the world. I remember when mom and dad would always say, Echale ganas. You know, like, always work hard. I asked myself the other day if that sentence has an expiration date. Because sometimes I sure wish it did. Last week while I was coming home from school, I was able to see dad head off to work his second shift of the day. My heart broke. As he drove off, I, I looked into his eyes and, and saw a tired soul that has devoted his entire life to work, <laughs> to barely support his family. Till this day, grandma tries to figure out how to make an extra buck just to put food on her table. I started to think about how they and every other immigrant that has crossed these borders enters a train that takes and takes, but never gives. And the only time it stops moving is when you drop dead. And I know, I know that they came here for a better life, but this so-called American dream seems very selective on who it grants freedom to. I just wish the opportunity to grow in this country didn't limit itself to someone who, who doesn't, who, who falls under the word citizen or, or, or someone who doesn't sound or look like us. Oh, what to think. Some of these Americans really complain about us taking their jobs. <laughs> As if they would ever put themselves through the pain and sweat our people go through. Yet they enjoy the fruits of our labor, right? I can kill less if they accept us or not. Because we will continue to be here. I care more about our people surviving. Not giving up so much of themselves. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of our farm workers being exploited. I'm, I'm tired of the abuse our street vendors have to suffer. It saddens me to see someone three times my age work insanely backbreaking jobs for just a speck of what others earn. What I fear most is growing old and knowing I had the privilege to actually do something about it, but instead I wasted my time getting angry and complaining. But then I just think of what you would do. <laughs> uh, I'm so hopeful, you know. I have been trying to surround myself with people just like you. Hardworking. Ambitious. <laughs> Loving. <laughs> I won't stop trying to help our family and our community. I will continue where you left off, hermana. <laughs> Echale ganas, right? <laughs> I 
Amigos, what did you think? Amazing, right? Felicidades to our finalists on a job well done. Thank you to NBC for your continued support and your commitment in showcasing Latinx talent. Thank you to our, all of our wonderful sponsors and to you for watching. If you want to learn more about Nosotros and what we are doing to uplift our community of creatives, visit our website at nosotrosorg.com. And don't forget to follow us on all social media platforms at nosotrosorg. On behalf of the entire Nosotros team, we thank you for being here with us tonight. That's it. That's our show. Buenas noches, amigos. Carter.